God, I just want to thank you for who you are. Father, Son, and Spirit, there's nobody else like you. There never has been. There never will be. And even what the enemy means for evil, you turn for good and for your glory. And I thank you for that. There's nobody else who can do that but you, Lord Jesus. And we find hope in your resurrection. We find hope in your redemption. We find hope in you, Lord Jesus. And so I pray right now for every woman in this room that she wouldn't hear from me. God, would she hear from you? Starting with me, I want to hear from you, God. I have nothing to offer anyone in this room, but your spirit in me does, and of that I am sure. And so Holy Spirit, this time is yours, and so are we. I ask you to illuminate your word of truth for us. I ask you to speak mightily to us. And God, I pray if there's a single woman in this room who does not yet know you as Savior, don't let her leave this room tonight without saying yes to your invitation of life and love and of freedom, Lord Jesus. Would you awaken us tonight? to the truth of who you are and who you have created us to be in you and with you and for you forevermore. Amen. All right, so uh, some of you might be anxious to know who our woven woman of the Bible for September is. And fun fact, it is actually our woven women of the Bible for September. That's right, there are two. You're going to find our woven women of the Bible for September in Exodus chapter 1. So if you do have your Bibles, feel free to open up and read with me in Exodus chapter 1. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. But also, if you've been at Woven before, then you know that you're free and welcome to enjoy story time. As so much of the Bible, including this, was originally intended to be heard in the context of community, I invite you to do so tonight. If you have already joined us for Woven and you have one of these Woven bookmarks, keep using that. If you don't have one yet, feel free to take one from your table and pop it in Exodus 1. And all month long, we're going to come back and come back and come back and see what the Spirit of the living God illuminates for us. So our woven women of the Bible for September, found in Exodus chapter 1, are two women, and their names are Shifra and Pua. Some of you may know them, some of you may not, but I'm so thrilled to get to share their story with you tonight. So we're going to begin in Exodus chapter 1, starting in verse 1. We're reading the whole chapter, and bear with me. These are the names of the sons of Israel, that is Jacob, who moved to Egypt with their father, each with his family, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. In all, Jacob had 70 descendants in Egypt, including Joseph, who was already there. In time, Joseph and all of his brothers died, ending that entire generation. But their descendants, the Israelites, had many children and grandchildren. In fact, they multiplied so greatly that they became extremely powerful and filled the land. Eventually, a new king came to power in Egypt, who knew nothing about Joseph or what he had done. He said to his people, Look, the people of Israel now outnumber us and are stronger than we are. We must make a plan to keep them from growing even more. If we don't, and if war breaks out, they will join our enemies and fight against us. Then they will escape from the country. So the Egyptians made the Israelites their slaves. They appointed brutal slave drivers over them, hoping to wear them down with crushing labor. They forced them to build the cities of Pithom and Ramses as supply centers for the king. But the more the Egyptians oppressed them, the more the Israelites multiplied and spread, and the more alarmed the Egyptians became. So the Egyptians worked the people of Israel without mercy. They made their lives bitter, forcing them to mix mortar and make bricks and do all the work in the fields. They were ruthless in all their demands. Then Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, gave this order to the Hebrew midwives, Shifra and Pua. When you help the Hebrew women as they give birth, watch as they deliver. If the baby is a boy, kill him. If it is a girl, let her live. 
But because the midwives feared God, they refused to obey the king's orders. They allowed the boys to live too. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives. Why have you done this? He demanded. Why have you allowed the boys to live? The Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, the midwives replied. They are more vigorous and have their babies so quickly that we cannot get there in time. So God was good to the midwives, and the Israelites continued to multiply, growing more and more powerful. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people, throw every newborn Hebrew boy into the Nile River, that you may let the girls live. This is the first chapter of the books of Exodus. Exodus comes right after Genesis, the first book of the Bible that tells us of the Genesis, the origin of God's people. We're coming right after Genesis chapter 50. We just sang it, verse 20. Joseph says to his brothers who had sold him into slavery in Egypt and he has now come into a position of power and he can provide and care for his family. These 12 tribes of Israel are the sons of his dad, Jacob. It's his brothers, it's his family. There's famine in the land of Canaan. They've come to Egypt to find nourishment. Joseph says to his brothers who are afraid of him because of how they've treated him and mistreated him. Genesis 50, Joseph says in verse 20, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. We've just come out of that. Exodus begins telling us that short history as a recap for us. There are 70 descendants of Jacob who are living in Egypt as foreigners, and they multiply, and they multiply. And so these Hebrew midwives, Shifra and Pua, that you may or may not know of, I know when I talk with women about some of their heroes in the Bible, women that they look up to in scriptures, I often hear Deborah and Ruth and Esther and praise God, they are women marked by faith in God. But so are these two women. And so many of us don't know them. And sure, they're not assigned very many verses in the scriptures, but they are assigned names. We've talked about women in woven here who are not assigned names in the scriptures, but they're still named and known before God, called and sent out according to his purposes, just like you. But these women are assigned names. And do you know, this was oral tradition before it was ever written down in history to remember. This means that the people of God believed in these stories so much. They were so foundational to who they were as a people and to understanding who God is that they passed these stories down from generation to generation to generation. And before we get to Moses in chapter 2 that everybody knows. Anybody else watch The Prince of Egypt? Best soundtrack ever. Okay, back to the point. Before we get to Moses, we have Shifra and Pua. We have Exodus chapter one. I'd argue we don't know that we'd have a Moses if we don't have a Shifra and Pua. Their story matters to God. And their story matters to the people of God. God has also put them in a position to save the lives of many people, just like Joseph, just like Moses, and dare I say, just like Jesus. And you and I today are sent out with that call to save. We're not the savior, but we point to the one who is. And so a new new king has come to power. The king of Egypt is the Pharaoh. He's the person with the highest position of power in the land. A new king has come to power, and the scriptures say he doesn't know Joseph. Now, this doesn't mean that him and Joseph are not acquainted. I mean, Joseph had long since passed away. This means he is not familiar with who Joseph is and how Joseph rules and reigns. And he doesn't care who Joseph was kind to. So these Israelites were foreigners in the land of Egypt. And they had been looked upon favorably up until now. But a new king comes to power who doesn't know Joseph. And I'm going to say he doesn't know the God of Joseph. And that's huge. 
Because now these people of God, the Israelites, who the Egyptians refer to as Hebrews, they're now made slaves. And why? This king makes a decree that is hateful. First to make them slaves and then to declare that every newborn Hebrew baby boy needs to be murdered. He makes these decrees of hate from a position of fear. If you were here on Sunday and you got to hear our pastor Jeff preach a sermon from Galatians on finding freedom from sin, he started to talk about the fruit of the spirit and he started with love and the fact that the opposite of love is not hate, it's fear. That every act of hate is motivated by fear and we see it crystal clear in the Pharaoh right here. As he says, these people are growing too much. If a war breaks out, they're going to join our enemies and fight against us and move out. We've got to take them out. That's a plan straight from the pit of hell. And the enemy still works the same way today. I'm here to tell you, and I might say it again, if you follow Jesus and you don't think the enemy wants to take you out, you are gravely mistaken. But we have hope in the God Almighty who we're reading about today. I pray you know him. So he says, let's make them slaves. They treat them as brutally as they can, but they continue to multiply and spread. Let me tell you this, wherever there is persecution, the church grows. It's the nature of our faith. Look at the life of Jesus who was murdered on our behalf and we're still talking about him today. All of Jesus' closest followers, his 12 disciples, nearly all of them were martyred for their faith. Judas died by suicide. If you don't think the enemy had a role in that, I would say otherwise. And John is the only one who is not martyred or killed, but he's exiled on an island. I'm here to tell you, we have a real enemy who still wants to take us out just like then. But God had a plan that no one and nothing could stand in the way of. They oppressed him, but they kept growing stronger. Meanwhile, Pharaoh keeps being afraid. And what is he afraid of? He's afraid of what he doesn't know. Isn't that interesting? If Pharaoh had just taken time to get to know them, perhaps that would result in love. But what we don't know causes us to fear and it leads us to hate. May we have ears to hear tonight that there are people in this world who we don't know and they're not like us. And as we sit in this chamber of not knowing them, our fear turns to hate and the enemy loves that and God grieves that. God loves for us to reach out to his people. Let me tell you that one day people from every language, people and tribe will be standing before the throne of God in heaven, it's going to look a lot different than this room right now. Would we love the other? It starts by getting to know the other, not hating that which is different from us and those who are different with us. I think he might have seen they have a lot in common being created in the image of God who sets eternity in all of our hearts. And so when that's not enough, he takes it a step further. He brings in our woven women of the Bible, Shifra and Pua. Shifra means fair. Pua means splendid. They're midwives. They give their lives to help bring about life in other people. That's their calling. And what does he do? The most powerful man in the land, their king, their pharaoh, he doesn't ask, he demands. He orders that they keep a watch on every Hebrew woman, woman delivering a baby. And if it's a boy, you kill him. Hold on, what? He asks them to do something. Nope, commands them to do something that is not only against their own people, the people of God, but it is the exact opposite of what they spend their lives doing. It's the exact opposite of their calling and their purpose. There's a reason that they were living for such a time as this. God has put them in a position to save many people. Praise God that they fear him more than Pharaoh. Because that's what the scriptures say. And I know that that word fear has a lot of different meanings to us in scripture and today. And yes, we often say fear is associated with honoring God and having reverence for him. And that is so true and true of this. And I'm not about to tell you that you need to be afraid of God because you don't. He's a good father. We can run to him at all times and every occasion. He has nothing but love for you as his children. But I am going to say that I think a little bit of how we define fear is true in this. 
because the Pharaoh is commanding something of them. My goodness, he could put them to death if he wanted to. But instead of fearing what the Pharaoh has in mind for them, they have a healthy fear of God, God, creator of life. They're midwives, for goodness sake. They're aware of the miracle of life and birth. The author of life is God, not them. And they know that one day they're going to have to stand before God. And what are they going to say? The Pharaoh told me to? As they put to death the people of God? No. Their fear of God outweighs their fear of Pharaoh. Let me rephrase it, though. Their faith in God, their trust in God, their belief in God, their conviction of who God is, is greater than the fear that the Pharaoh might instill in them. Praise God that they stood up to him. Do you see why I think these are women we need to know? Their acts of courage are just as great as so many other women in the scriptures, and yet so many of us don't know them. So they allow these boys to live, and obviously the Pharaoh notices and he calls them in. He's like, what are you doing? What's happening? Why, why, is, why is this not working, right? Why have you allowed them to live? And they reply with a little bit of wit. And they say what? Verse 19. The Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. They are more vigorous and have their babies so quickly that we cannot get there in time. Now I understand That what they say is not necessarily the whole truth. And I am not about to decipher for you when that is God-honoring or not. Overall, being dishonest is not honoring to God. But let's look at what they're doing here. They're going against an evil decree straight from the pit of hell. And they're saving the people of God. They're saving many. They're fearing God over Pharaoh. And what they're saying is not entirely untrue. The Hebrew women aren't like the Egyptian women. That's true. The Hebrew women know the God of Israel, God Almighty, our God today, the God of the Old Testament and the New, he's the same forever and always. And it says they're more vigorous. That word for vigorous in Hebrew is haye. It means lively, full of life. Yes, they are full of God, the God of life. And what's interesting, that word haye for lively comes from the same Hebrew root word that's fun to say for you karate people, (laughs) haya. And haya is the word that's used earlier when it talks about how they allowed the boys to live. Haya means to sustain life. So what they're doing is what they're describing of women. It's all about life, don't you see? So what they're saying is not entirely untrue. And I wasn't there. Perhaps they didn't arrive before the boys were born. Maybe they walked very slowly (laughs) and stopped to get a drink on the way. I have no idea. Nevertheless, they stand before the Pharaoh. They give this defense. And we don't hear the Pharaoh's response immediately. We go first to God. Praise God for that. And it says, God was good to the midwives. The Israelites continued to multiply, growing more and more powerful. God was not going to let anybody ruin his story. No one and nothing can stand in the way of God's perfect plan. He's sovereign and he's good. And no amount of persecution or suffering or oppression will keep the people of God down. Where there is persecution, the church always grows. Do you believe it? Verse 21, and because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Now, I'm not here to tell you that if you have faith in God, he's going to give you a family if you've been praying for one. But how cool is this, that these women who gave their lives to help bring about families for other people, who the Pharaoh demanded they bring an end to the families of God. They refused, put their faith in God over Pharaoh, and God gives them families of their own. What I do know is that your acts of faith in God do not go unnoticed by him. Never. And I'm not preaching a prosperity gospel, but I promise you that he will always honor your act of faith. No matter what the cost is, I promise the reward in him is so much better because he is the reward. He gives us a family today in his son and in one another by the spirit of the living God. We are bound together. That's the heart of woven and thread groups. And do you see that it's two women, not just a woman this month, it's two, and I think it matters. I'd like to think that if this was just one woman, she would have done the same thing. But I don't know. This was a very powerful 
man, the king of all the land, the Pharaoh of Egypt, demanding a horrific thing. But how kind of God that they were together. We truly are better together in the kingdom of God. Scriptures don't tell us, but I'd like to think that as they heard that demand in the same room, that they were able to talk with one another, encourage one another, remind one another of what is true of God, what is true of them and their lives that are submitted to God to help bring about life and not death, and that together they were able to find the courage to stand before the most powerful man in the land who cannot compare to God Almighty who is worthy of our worship. He's worthy of our faith. He's worthy of our obedience, no matter the cost. We're better together. These women were not working for man. They were working for God. That's a principle for us today. Do you hear it? If you don't have women who you can stand side by side with in faith, who can remind you what is true of God, and what is true of one another. I urge you to get in a thread group. That's not a plug. That is my whole heart. That's why we're here. Because the enemy is trying to take you out still today. You can stand on the solid rock of God. You can stand on the solid truth of his word and in the spirit of the living God. But he gave us a family and one another for a reason. Are we living into this community he's provided us? He's not preaching something he doesn't practice. Look at God, Father, Son, and Spirit, communal from the very beginning. He's created us for that. With him and one another, are we living into it? Are we living into our calling? See, these women are called midwives, but dare I say they've been called and sent out by God for a purpose. Their lives matter to God and to the people of God, and so do yours. We have a problem today of thinking that the only people called and sent out by God are people with faith-based job titles, and that's a lie straight from the pit of hell too. If you know Jesus, you are sent out by him. You are filled by the spirit of the living God who raised Jesus from the dead, who wants to bring life through you. He raised up Joseph to save many He rose, raised, I can't speak, but Shifra and Pua, he put them in a position to save the lives of many. He calls Moses, who fights it. But God called him to help set his people free to save the lives of many. He brings his own son, Jesus, to save the lives of all who will trust in him. And if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, you're going to hear Paul say in 31, whether you eat, drink, or whatever you do, to it all to the glory of God. And in verse 33 in the NLT, he says, I don't just do what's best for me. I do what's best for others so that many may be saved. Friends, that is the call on your life and mine today. We are not here to do what's best for us, but what's best for others so that many may be saved. This is our heritage. We are the people of God. If you know him and friend, if you don't know him, what are you waiting for? Outside of God, there is much to fear, but in Christ Jesus, there is therefore now no condemnation, and we have nothing to fear, but only a Savior to love and trust and follow. Because the truth is, you and I are still in positions where somebody is asking us to go against our own people and to do the opposite of what God has called us to. The enemy only has a few tactics. This is still one of them. And maybe it's not always somebody who's clearly in a position of power. Maybe it's someone you don't even know. You can't even identify the source. We do so much online these days. But I challenge you this month to reflect on where you have given in to those evil demands, to go against the people of God, and to do the opposite of what God has put you on earth to do. I challenge you to find encouragement in one another, to walk in the fullness and the freedom of the presence of the Lord, to walk in the fullness of your calling. There's a reason why you're living in this time, not in the 1700s, not a few hundred years from now. Right now, God created you for a purpose only you can fulfill. How incredible is that? I don't know what that is, but he does. But I'm here to say you have a calling on your life by God and it matters. 
And I don't care if you think it's ministry or not. Do you know the word for ministry is service? The word for minister is servant. We are all servants of God. If we know him, that's what you walk into. Spoiler alert. Yes, you're children of the king of kings, but you're also servants of God. But God has a calling on your life to help bring about his story of rescue today. Not just in these pages, but right now, in 2022, God has people he wants to save. God has life he wants to bring where there's death and darkness, and he wants to use you to do it. Sister, will you walk in him? Will you walk with him? And will you do it together the way he always intended for us to do? I'm going to give you some time to talk around your table. It's the same question we do every single month, and it's this. How do you see your story in these women's stories? How do you see your story in Shifra and Pua's story? Talk around your tables for 10 minutes and I'll wrap us up.